All right, welcome to Fantasy Island. Not really, it's the Bad Dog Agility Show. We've got a great topic for you today, but before we get started, we're gonna start with the usual audio-visual check. So if you can hear my voice, and if you can see me moving my arms around, be sure to give us a thumbs up so Sarah knows that everything is going okay and we can go ahead and get started with the show. Now we are coming to you from a new location today. Not really, it's actually still the same yard, but we've just changed the camera angle so everything might look just a little bit different today. Now do we have- Hello from Hawaii. Oh, okay, very nice. Aloha to my peoples. We can hear it. And okay, we we've got lots of thumbs up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in Hawaii, graduated high school there, Lelihua High School, class of 94, go mules. All right, so today we're going to talk about three ways to create distance in your agility handling. Distance is always a great topic, and uh, it's very relevant right now in agility because of all the emphasis on running. Everybody is going to tell you to run. Every seminar you, you go to is going to tell you to run, but a lot of you out there, you're like me. Your dog is a lot faster than you are, and you're having problems running and staying ahead of your dog or keeping up with your dog, and you're very interested in doing a lot of this agility handling with some distance. All right, so we're gonna talk about three different things, three different ways to create that distance in your handling, and we're gonna show you how to use it. We've got a great demonstration course set up. We've got some slow motion. We've got live demos, big dog, small dog. You're really gonna like it. Let's get right to it. The first one, the first way to create distance is really the most common way to do it. Almost everyone in agility is familiar with this and it's really focused on individual obstacle performance. Your dog is gonna do some obstacle no matter what the handler is doing. So, for example, let's say I'm doing this, this jump over here and I wanna do a backside. So my dog is gonna come in this direction, come around, and take this backside. For myself personally, my dog does not have very good independent obstacle performance. Well, what does that mean? It means I need to be right here or my dog is gonna jump this way and not get the backside. Okay, so I have to be right here. Now, trainers who have done a better job than I have can send their dog to the backside from over here, right? So they can send their dog to the backside and have confidence that their dog is gonna take this very correct path. And you can see that's a big advantage. I have to run all the way over here because I have no independence. These other handlers get to send their dog from back here and now look what happens. While their dog does the backside, they're free to go wherever they want. They can go this way, they can go that way. Most importantly, they can go back this other direction. This gives them an advantage over me. So if you have good individual obstacle performance, that means for every particular individual obstacle, your dog knows to do it, and to do it no matter what you're doing, it's okay if you fall behind. Okay, so this is the distance everybody is kind of familiar with. Okay, the second kind of uh, distance that you can create is leaving the obstacle earlier. So again, let's say this time I'm doing a wrap at this jump. So I want my dog to come in this way, turn and wrap, and head back in this general direction here. So, you can come all the way here to the wing and watch your dog do it. So I watch my dog take off, I watch them come around, there they are, and now we're gonna race off to the next thing. Well, that's a race I'm always going to lose because my dog is faster than me, okay? So when you do this, when you stare at your dog and watch them do the obstacle, you are not leaving the obstacle early enough. You're dog watching. And now you have no distance. So how do we get that distance? Well, you can come all the way to the jump, but as your dog is coming in, you want to go ahead and leave. So I'm already leaving, my dog is still going that way. We're headed in two different directions. Dog's going this way, I'm going this way, now suddenly we have a lot of distance and a lot of space. So that's the second way to create distance. This is the very popular one right now that you're gonna see emphasized a lot in seminars, international handling, and probably from your own instructors. Okay, the third way to generate distance is lateral, lateral handler path. And this is the one that people never learn about, uh, they don't hear about, 
And if you use it, and you use it well, it's a very, very clever way to shorten your own yardage and basically get around and cheat on the course. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say we're gonna take this jump and do a turn, a 90 degree turn, the dog's gonna go like this and head in this direction here. I'm gonna make this cone my dog. And so normally, I would just run alongside my dog and then as the dog is taking off, I'm just gonna turn and head this way. Now imagine this, as I head toward this jump, instead of being here, what if I were lateral to my dog? One step, two steps, maybe even a third step. Now when I head this way to the jump, the dog is gonna parallel my path. So I move this way, the dog's gonna move that way. So now they're taking the jump. Now they're taking off. So I turn, and now I head in this direction. Well, look at how much distance I've created now between me and my dog. My dog is over there by that jump. I'm over here. Now I can do all kinds of crazy maneuvers and really control the next part of the course. So lateral movement is something that people take for granted and they don't plan when they're walking courses. The best obstacles for lateral movement are the ones where your dog has to do the obstacle and they can't peel off and come with you anyway. So you can probably imagine what those are. The weave poles, the dog walk, the A-frame, the seesaw. Those are all obstacles that your dog is stuck doing and while they're doing it, you can be very lateral to them and getting ready for the next part of the course. But those are also all the obstacles where people are really afraid of getting any kind of separation from their dog. And so that's where it's important to really teach those obstacles well so you have the confidence to do them not the same distance all the time. Because right now in agility, it's very popular to do wing-to-wing -wing running. I call it wing-to-wing -wing running. People, especially people who run fast, like myself, they're gonna run from this wing to this wing here, like I can touch it, and then I'm gonna come back here, and then I'm gonna come run to this wing over here, and we're gonna run all the way from wing to wing to wing. If you can create a little bit of lateral distance, you don't have to run as far. So if I start here from in the middle, I can go from here to here, back to here, back to here, and back to here, and all I've done is taken a couple steps in every direction. So it's much easier for me to get around. I don't have to run wing to wing. And so this is a great way for some of you slower handlers with faster dogs to keep up with all those young people who are really fast and you see running around on the course. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we've got new technology we're gonna try today. We're gonna try a second camera. We're gonna see how this goes. You're gonna walk the course with me. I've got a course here, we're gonna go through it. There is gonna be a handout, it's gonna have the course on it. It's gonna have uh, these three ways to create distance. We've got them labeled and listed out for you guys. So you know, you, as soon as you finish this, you're probably gonna forget what they are when you're trying to tell your friends and you're all excited about it. So you'll have that sheet. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and switch camera views now. All right, we're on camera two. So the first thing I want this camera to show is the straight line of jumps we're gonna start with. So we've got jumps one, two, Three, on a straight line. So you should be able to see the dog. Nice straight line. And we've got an almost wrap. We're not going back this way. We're actually going to the tunnel. And go ahead and Sarah, come over this view. Start over here and pan this way. From this jump here, after that three jump straight line, we're gonna take this tunnel. And look at this long distance you've gotta go. Dogs are gonna come rocketing out of this tunnel and look at this jump. It's unfair how close we put this jump to this tunnel. The dogs are gonna to wanna to take it straight on like this, but we want the dog to take the backside. Okay, so the dog is supposed to come around here and take the backside. So we really need the handler to be up here to control this backside so the dog doesn't go off course. Then the difficulty is, well, how do we get all the way from that purple jump, right? How do we go all the way from this thing over here all the way to that backside over there. And that's where judges are really challenging you. And so we're gonna take a look at all three of these ways to create distance and see how we can use them and see what kind of results we can get. And so we got you a big dog, got you a small dog, and we're gonna start with a video demonstration. It's a little bit of a change up. Usually we do the live demo first, but this time 
going to do the video uh, with the slow mo first, then we're going to do the live um, demonstration. So give us just a second. We're going to get that set up. All right. We're switching camera people here. So you're focused on me, but we're about to start that video for you. It's going to take you through everything that we're uh, talking about right now. Let's take a look at some slow motion here. I'm starting Sarah at the cone so she can't get ahead and cheat. She's going to run from wing to wing. So she's going to run all the way to jump number three, and she's actually going to touch the wing to make sure she doesn't cheat. And you can see that by the time Venture enters the tunnel right here, that Sarah is very, very far behind. By the time the dog exits the tunnel, Sarah is stuck halfway down the tunnel, and she's going to have to send Venture on a pure verbal to try and get this backside, which is a very difficult thing to do. Fortunately for her, he happens to get it this time. So now we'll take a look at the slow motion on the independent obstacle performance. So on this one, Sarah's not going to run all the way up to that jump. She's going to stop creating a little bit of distance between herself and the wing of the jump. And Venture is expected to go perform the jump. Meanwhile, Sarah can move on to the next part of the obstacle, which she's going to do here. We'll zoom back out. And if you take a look, by the time Venture hits the tunnel here, Sarah's already at the end of the tunnel. And this is going to let her uh, control the backside pretty easily and let her be in good position for that backside. Over. Over. On this one, Sarah's going to go all the way up to the jump, and she's just going to leave very, very soon. So if we take a look and we zoom in here, she's all the way at the jump. She can reach out and touch that wing if she wants but she's going to leave very, very soon. So you can see she's leaving, and Venture is not even taken off yet. So the dog has to really commit to this obstacle. In the teaching phase, a lot of dogs are going to refuse to jump and come with the handler, and you can use reward placement and an assistant to help your dog commit to that obstacle. But watch as Venture lands and comes around the wing. Look at the distance that Sarah has created. And remember, she went all the way up to the purple wing. So she ran the maximum yardage, but because she didn't wait by the wing, she left as early as possible, she's able to create this massive distance. And so if we take a look here and zoom back out, by the time Venture hits the tunnel, she's most of the way down this tunnel. Not quite as far as we saw with the independent obstacle performance, but she is able to create quite a bit of distance and enough to make that backside very easy. Here, Sarah's going to use some lateral distance. So instead of starting here by the wing, she's going to move laterally about two yards. And so she's going to take a parallel path. Instead of running this way alongside the wings, she's going to run parallel to that. And you can see that she's able, because she's able to cheat kind of in this direction with her lateral distance, that brings her a lot closer to her ultimate target, which is this jump way out here. And so by the time Venture hits the tunnel, again, she's comfortably in position to make this backside. And in this last example here, Sarah's using all three things. She's going to start lateral. She's going to stop from a distance. And while the dog is engaged with the jump, she's going to leave as soon as possible. So Venture is just taking off, but Sarah's already leaving. By the time he comes around the wing, she's already taken two steps in the new direction. And so you can see she gets massive distance here. By the time he enters the tunnel, she's already completely clear of the tunnel exit and very easily controls this backside. Okay, we are ready for the live demo. We're going to start with Brittany and Trek. They are going to be jumping 12 inches, and we're going to start them off with the wing-to-wing -wing running. So this is the handler that doesn't use any kind of distance. 
They like, they like to run a lot. Their, their, their instructors told them agility is a running sport and they need to run faster and run more. All right, so I think we'll have them do that again because I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so we're going to have Brittany start with her dog. We're going to have Brittany go all the way there. Oh, the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop, come back. Okay, so no lead out, no cheating. So what, So basically, the reason I'm having Brittany do this again is she totally cheated, right? She took a long lead out to get far ahead of her dog, right? If she did that, then we wouldn't need any distance handling at all. So this is these long straight lines you see at these AKC shows, right, where the judge is making you run a really far, uh, far away, and there's no way that your dog can keep up with you. Okay, so we're going to handicap Brittany here. We're not going to let her cheat and lead all the way out to jump number two. So back, back, pass the cone. Okay, now good luck. Go to purple. Okay. Quick, 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 quick. Good try. So you can see it's a foot race, right? As they take that jump and come into the tunnel, the dog and handler are running side by side. How many times has this happened to you? You know coming out of that tunnel, the dog is not going to be able to get to that backside, so they go off course there. Okay, so now that's, that's the reason. We're showing you that. That's the reason we need some distance handling, even if you do like to run and you're a fast handler. And so now we're going to get the independent obstacle performance. So Brittany's going to kind of do, uh, some people will call it ascend, ascend and go. Going to ascend to that uh, last third jump there and then head in the new direction. And we'll see how much that helps Brittany out. But we want her to start from the cone. No leading out. No leading out. No cheating here. OK, go. Who stumbled? I thought Brittany did. OK, it looks like Brittany got uh, faked out there. <laughs> no lead out. Okay. There you go. And now easily, easily. OK, so I definitely threw Brittany off. She didn't know that I was not going to let her cheat like that. So that's why I put this cone out here. So the handler has to start back here with the cone. But you can see that she's able to create that separation, get that distance, and easily get to the backside, very easily. So that's the first way to do it, right? Let the dog get ahead of you. Now she's going to do it the second way. She's not going to let the dog get ahead of her. She's going to run all the way to the purple jump, but she is not going to wait, OK? She's not going to watch her dog take that purple jump. Even before Trek takes off for that purple jump, Brittany's already going to be heading for the next thing. Let's see how much of an advantage she can get out of that. Is it going to be enough to get this backside? We'll find out. Very nice. So you can see that as Trek was coming in and about to take off for the last jump, Brittany had already done her move, and she's heading for the tunnel. And it let her get there to control the backside. OK. And now the third way, she's going to do some lateral distance. So she's going to be moving way over here to this other kind of little conish area, somewhere, somewhere in through here. So instead of starting here at the cone, she's going to move off to the side. And let's see if that helps her out. This will be the hardest for some of you all to train. Okay. But you can see the lateral distance that she created is very, very effective. And it's so effective because it moves her closer to the fence, closer to the tunnel, which moves her closer to controlling the backside. So it's really awesome. Thank you, Brittany. Next, we've got Sarah and Venture. She's going to do the big dog demonstration. While she's getting venture, I'm going to set these bars for 16 inch, and I'm going to keep talking. So I think the distance handling is very underrated. People aren't using it enough at, the, at some of the highest levels. You know, you go to nationals, you go to the world championship, running um, back and forth, very athletic, covering lots of distances. And it is mesmerizing and fun to watch. It's fun to run. That's how I run most of the time, at least with the Golden Retriever. But the fact is, judges are designing courses that it's making it harder and harder to do that. And so you need some of these additional skills. 
in order to be successful at agility. All right, what do you want first? Uh, same order. So you're going to do, you're going to try and run wing to wing. Okay, no right? cheating. No cheating. Start here at the cone. Okay, he actually made it. He actually made it. Very nice. Very tough. She, she ran from corner to corner. Nice job. Sarah, very athletic. Venture is fast. Um, I don't think she watched her dog very much there at uh, purple, but that's okay. Do you want to watch more? No, I do not. We want you to go on to the next part. It's going to be individual obstacle performance. So here, she's not going to go all the way to purple. She's going to create some of that distance before the jump. And you see how easily, easily she gets over here uh, to control that backside. So very nicely done. Again, that's the most common way that people control distance. And now this is the trendy new way to control distance. You go all the way to the jump to commit a dog, but you're going to leave as early as possible, sometimes even heading in the opposite direction as your dog. So this one, I get a little lead out? So that I can yeah, out yeah, you can, you can lead out a little bit. I made Brittany run the whole thing, but I suppose you can. So again, she gets there very easily to control the backside. Okay, third, third way she's going to demonstrate is the lateral handler path. And again, this is the sneaky one. Not enough people do this. You want to do it on your contacts, your weave poles. Nicely done. And again, she's there easily to control the backside. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah and Venture. All right, so now we've done the live demos. You've seen the video demos. I think we are ready for the Q&A. I am going to start uh, with just uh, one thing that I will say, because I see this happen a lot for you people out there, especially those of you who do do gamblers. When I come in and I create distance for my dog, let's say I'm doing a backside, I look the same no matter how far away I am from the jump. This is uh, my thing, my personal opinion. Okay? It doesn't mean I'm absolutely correct and that other people are absolutely wrong, but it's worth mentioning because I'm, uh, I'm about to tell you why. So let's say I come in, I want my dog to wrap here, okay? and I cue it like this. Okay? I run in here, and I cue my wrap like this. Okay? From farther away, I'm going to look the same. I'm going to cue my wrap like this and give whatever my word it is. And if I'm really far away, it's going to be the same. But some of you out there, and my dog is going to turn tight, some of you out there, We'll do it like this, like this, but then when you get far away, suddenly you do this. You take a big step and you put your hand out like this, right? And you want your dog to do this. And then your dog is going to take the jump, and they're going to take it in extension, and then they're going to go off course, and you're going to lose control. They're not going to wrap back to you. And it's because this is a very different cue from this, or whatever you've been doing. So whatever you're doing, just make sure that you're consistently doing that cue. You see a lot of people using the big arm, and then they suddenly wonder why their dog is going off course. Their dog is not wrapping. They're not turning back toward the handler. That's why. So this mostly applies to wraps and to um, backsides. So I just wanted to start the Q&A with that. Do we have other questions? OK, so no questions. I will give you guys a minute to put in your questions. I should have called for them a little bit sooner. But there is a sheet. It's got these three things on there. Uh, the three ways to create distance with your agility handling. It's got this course map. It's got diagrams so you can follow the handler path for each of those skills. And it's got, I think, two additional sequences that Sarah put together just so you can practice with your friends. So you want to go ahead and go and download those. It's at baddogagility.com forward slash distance. Right? D-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. So distance. Yes, you did spell it correctly. Very good, very good. All right, do we have any questions? Okay, no questions, that's okay. If you guys run into questions 
or you have any issues, let's say you set this up and your dog is doing something, you're not sure what's going on, put a video in the comments, put a YouTube link, ask your question. We always come behind, answer questions, even days or weeks later. Okay, so we do have a question. Someone was asking about how to create distance when the dog is on the dog walk. And the way to create distance on all of these is at the entry point. And this applies to all the contacts and it applies to the jumps. So let me tell you a mistake that people commonly make. Is the camera on me? Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's say we're doing these two jumps here, right? And we wanna do um, lateral distance, right? That was the question, right? Lateral distance on the dog walk? Creating distance on the dog walk, yeah. While they're on the dog walk. Okay, so as, I guess my follow-up question is, do you mean distance before the dog walk, after the dog walk, or lateral to the dog walk? I think the specificity was the dog will not do the contact on the walk. If she is ahead of the dog walk? Lateral, lateral. Okay, if the dog is lateral, lateral to the dog walk. Okay, once they get on the dog walk, they should do the dog walk no matter what. Um, so the dog walk is nice because once they get on, even if you peel away, they should be okay. If they are not, the most common fix is to converge on the dog's dog walk path. So, for example, my dog will do the dog walk, but she will miss her running contact if I am diverging, if I am peeling away. So, if this is the dog walk, okay, let's pretend this tunnel is the dog walk. So we get on the dog walk, right? And I start to do this. I'm diverging. I'm moving away from the dog walk. She's going to miss the contact. Like 90% of the time, she's going to miss. So when I get on, I have to either stay close, or if the design of the course puts her on the dog walk and I'm far away from her, so let's say I'm here and she's getting on, I converge. I head for the bottom, and I meet her at the bottom. So if you're having problems with performance, and I'm not sure exactly what kind of performance problem you're having, um, my first thought is to converge rather than diverge. Yeah, and then I would definitely work on your dog walk, like proof it against handler motion. A lot of people are very motion dependent. So if the handler stops or slows down or peels away, it looks to the dog like they've stopped. Um, here we go. Okay, how about creating distance with more than one obstacle? when the dog is performing several obstacles at a distance from the handler. Um, so... I've, I've got a thought. Oh, go ahead. So I think um, when you have more than one obstacle, I think the bread and butter is um, lateral distance because you can stay parallel to your dog's path and have a lot of distance between you, but you're still paralleling their path and, and that's a, a good way to create distance there. Um, because eventually there's a turn. Right. right. The, the judge can only make you go three, maybe four jumps. If you take the longest part of a run, the diagonal across the entire map, they can't do more than, what, like 60, 70 feet, right. really. But when you're talking about like, you know, like a, a gambler's type situation or a fast type situation at the highest levels, that's where you really have to have that individual obstacle proficiency, that verbal component. Um, you're, at the highest levels, you're most likely not going to be able to get away with just creating distance or um, clever handling. There's going to have to be like a, a high, higher level verbal training. You're going to have aspect. to be able to discriminate obstacles verbally, and you're going to have to, I think someone was asking about it, the go on command. So let's, let's take a quick look at the go on. Let's say if, I'm, if I can be like Sarah and take obstacles one, two, and I'm anywhere here on the landing side of two, I can comfortably send to three, okay? But now let's say I'm over here, and my dog is over there at two, and I need them to take three, right? Now I have a problem, okay? That's where the go on has to happen, because go on is gonna mean go straight. Go on and take the next obstacle, whatever it is. So someone might say, go on over, go on weaves. This is if you fall more than one obstacle behind, because otherwise you start to affect your acceleration and deceleration cues because you're still running forward, right? So if I'm running forward, 
and I'm falling more and more behind, and then my dog can't see me anymore, right? They're not really cueing off your body. Anyway, that's also a good spot to have that verbal, to say go on. Otherwise, the dogs just kind of curl toward wherever you were last. So if I'm on the left side, they're going to curl this way. If I'm on the right side, they're going to curl the other way. So that's where you want to have the go on and your left and your right. Now we have tons of questions. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, how about this one? Do you use targets to teach distance? Yes, you can. You can, but you don't necessarily have to. There are some people that like it, some people that don't like it. I personally like it. So I would use targets and I would use an assistant. So say, for example, I was doing um, backside work, right? Uh, two different ways. So let's say I'm going to not use, uh, let's say I don't want to use a target. I'm always going to reward for my hand, right? I'm going to have the toy here in this hand. I'm going to have the dog here. And I'm just going to go here, do a bunch of reps, and just slowly work backwards until I'm here. And the dog's always being reinforced here. They're going to go, take it, and I'm going to reward them here. Let's say they're really struggling. I can take this toy, put it right here behind the wing, right? And so the dog knows the toy is there, OK? And now I can let the dog go. They're going to go around, get the toy, and then I'll call them to me and play with them here. OK, so that's reward placement. Another way to do that is have someone stand here, and then as the dog approaches, they can visibly drop the toy, right? So the dog sees a toy being dropped. That you're starting it as a lure or target. Eventually, it'll become a distraction that you have to work through. Um, and then you can do the same thing with food, with a bowl of food. And the last thing to do, if you don't have an assistant, if you don't place it, is you can throw it, right? So I have the toy here, I got the dog here, and then I'm just going to throw it. And I'm going to throw it right here. So the dog is constantly going to get reinforcement for not taking the jump this way and for going this way. And then eventually I will stop throwing the toy, send the dog, and then delay the toy until the dog comes around and then throw the toy. So you can do it any number of ways, food or toy, but yes, targets are fine. You can target to a bowl. You can target to a manners minder, treat and train, um, a ball on a stick, a cone, whatever you want to do. And I think that this is related to the question somebody had about um, tr uh, training leaving early. Uh, the dog is a Velcro dog. Um, I would say that you can use the same idea of, of placing the toy on wraps. You can put the toy out there so that your dog has a little bit more incentive to take the jump before coming back to you. and then and then just build up that skill. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say about training the dog to commit is that you need to push yourself in practice to leave. Um, and so, you know, if you're always comfortably there, you're never pushing the limits of what you can do, you're not going to kind of stretch that if that if your dog, your dog. Yeah, if your dog never refuses a jump, you're not leaving you soon enough. You're pushing it enough, right. They, every once in a while, you should pull them off. When I practiced this, I pulled Venture off because I was pushing to leave as soon as I could. And that lets you know how far you can go. And you may be able to go further than you think you can. Or th through practice, you're going to get to where you can leave earlier than you could previously. Right. But you've got to push that boundary. Right. So in practice, if I can make you 15 feet, then I know in a trial, I'm pretty comfortable doing 10 to 12 feet. Right. Um... OK, is it better to run with hands at your side until you need to give them a cue to do a push, a wrap, et cetera? Oh, that totally is handler dependent. There are some handlers that run entire courses like this. Uh, that's kind of like me. I'm mostly like that. There are some handlers that run with almost no arms except at the wings, and then they put very big arms. Some handlers run very, very low. They tend to be small dog handlers. So it uh, totally depends. There have been very fine handlers who have been affected by stroke or other um, injury or illness, and they have you know, only one arm, no arms, or they have arms, but they don't have use of those arms. Um, and so you can teach your dog to cue off other things as well. So hands is really a preference. Different people use them in different ways. Um, at what point in training a puppy do you start with lateral distance? Is this when they're competition height? Oh, at groundwork. Um, I think it depends on the dog. Like the more quickly a dog is learning and they're pretty motivated and enthusiastic, um, I think you can teach it, you know, right from the beginning. And for dogs that aren't quite there, you can still teach it right at the beginning. So the answer is basically teach it right at the beginning, um, but it's not something that you want to advance to until they're very comfortable taking it in all different varieties when they're right here at the wing. And you almost always are going to need to use an assistant 
or have a sit stay or down stay. And I don't like to teach the sit stay or down stay really young. Like I know some people do. I usually don't do it with my dogs. The formal one that I'm gonna use at a trial until they're like a year old, like minimum. Um, that's just me. Other people have really good start line stays at a very, very young age. I just feel like it's very mentally demanding. I don't like to pair it with the agility training. I just prefer to have a holder. So I'll have a holder here sitting in front of this jump like this. And so the first repetition might be like this, and then I reward the dog, and then I'll step out. That's number two, that's number three, that's number four. That's ideal. If they're like perfect, you know, in reality, are you gonna be able to go one, two, three, four, five, six in one session? No, right? In reality, what's gonna happen is you're gonna do two here, you're gonna do this, and they'll get it, okay. Now you should do a couple more here before you go, and now you try this third spot, and then they, they refuse. They don't take it, they come straight to you. Now you gotta make it easier. You gotta step back in. Oh, they come to you again. Okay, well, let's make it easier again, and now maybe I have to use a lure. Okay, so everything depends on what the dog is offering you. But that's what I would do. I would have someone set up here, and then you can start to do that. You can also do it with a target. That's probably the best easy way to get the toy off of you, get them focused forward. So assistant holds the dog here. I got the bowl, the toy, the food, whatever. It's over here. And now I'm over here, and then I say over, and they're just gonna go chase the toy or eat the food. And now the next one is over, 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 but they get comfortable with you being in these different positions. So that's how you're gonna introduce lateral distance. You're basically just gonna have them run for their reward. You're gonna put yourself in different spots. Now you're gonna start adding handler motion. So now you can start with the dog, run forward, and then move laterally and do that as well. All right, I see no correction happening when jumps are knocked while training distance. Is that not relevant at this point? Um, that is a training philosophy. It kind of depends on your dog. Like if your dog is a bar knocker, it's probably more important, a, a bigger deal for you to address those bars. Occasionally bars are gonna come down. Occasionally dogs are gonna miss a weave pull. We're not gonna freak out about it. We're, we're definitely not gonna positively punish our dogs. Um, whether or not we choose to withhold the reward kind of depends on our focus. And that's part of the reason why you would lower bars. So for example, Venture has the ability to jump 26 inches. We did his demonstration today at 16 inches. Okay, we know he's got issues with bars, but we're not focused on the bars, right? We're training the handling. Today we're working on the handling. We're doing the teaching, especially with puppies. Like I'm just, this just not something that I'm going to really worry about. Like I'm focused on the handling. It's why we're putting the bar on the ground or at eight inches, making it so ridiculously easy that they're not learning to drop bars, certainly. You know, they're only gonna knock it accidentally, you know, from backing into it, something like that. So it depends on what your focus is. Now, if we're out there and we're doing jump training or we're doing hard sequencing, we're getting ready for a competition, we're moving it up to 26 inches, if the bars are coming down, then we're definitely gonna withhold rewards and then jackpot them when he does them correctly. But if we're focused on something else, like if I'm working on my running contacts and I'm putting jumps at the end, I'm generally not putting them at 26 inches. I'm putting them at like 16 inches, right? Because I'm not worried about the jump. What if she does a beautiful running dog walk that I want to reward and then she goes and she takes the jump at 26 inches and she drops it. Now I have to withhold the reward, right, for the bar. And now I, have, I wasn't able to really reward the dog walk like I really wanted to, right, with her favorite toy. So if I'm working on the dog walk, I am working on the dog walk. Okay, I'm not worried about the jumping. Um, oh, this is about the, the Velcro dog. Like, if you do pull them off early, how do you then keep them in the game? Oh, okay. So for that, it's just the same way that we deal with all mistakes. We offer them some kind of other cue, other behavior. So I bring my dog up here. You know, I try to hang back and send my dog over, and they get confused, and they refuse, and they look at me. Okay? Sometimes I'll wait for a second, just a second, and see, sometimes they'll hop over. And then you can praise them, um, and they'll start to get the idea. But let's say they have no idea, you know, they come back to you, they start getting demotivated. Then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna say, that's all right, touch my hand, right? Do a nose touch, uh, shake my hand, or um, uh, do a sit, or I'm gonna recall them, or they're gonna do whatever tricks that you've taught your dog to do. And I'm gonna have them do two or three tricks. So they're earning that reinforcement, okay? They didn't get the $100 bill, but they're getting a couple of ones. They're still interested. 
they know there's the possibility of getting the $100, they're still going to come back and work for you. But if you just have refusal after refusal after refusal, and then the dog just gets really down on themselves and there's no rewarding, then they're going to struggle. So you want to have some kind of other behavior. The other cheap one I like to do is eye contact. It's really good. Okay. Um, oh wait. This one? okay, in what situation would you choose to decel at the wing versus a lateral send to the jump? Um, totally depends on what comes next on the course. Um, and whenever I can, I would cheat and use both, right? I would decel from a distance and be lateral. I mean, that's like the ultimate genius. That's what, that's what Brittany was doing out here, right? They've got lateral, which brings them closer to this line, this back line, right? And they hung back. So if we divide the yard into quadrants, right? We want to be close to the fence, and we want to be close to the green jump. So the lateral distance lets us be close to the fence, and hanging back on your D-cell lets you be close to the green jump, right? So it makes the line from here to that corner very short. So here, like this is the ultimate. I'm decelling from a distance, and I'm lateral, so my line is from here to that green jump, the wing, right? But if I sacrifice either one, I'm moving myself away from that, so I don't get the benefit. So uh, your question, it really depends on the next part of the course, but you want to cheat at every opportunity. Okay. Here we go. Um, I think the last question we have was about wing jumps versus wingless. And I would say that almost everything in agility is harder with wingless jumps. Wings are going to, wings are going to force a little bit of lateral distance to start with which can help you out to create more. But I would definitely work up to doing it with either because a lot of times wingless jumps can really create problems on course uh, where, when your dog isn't used to seeing them. Right, so there's a couple of things you need to know. First, international competition, I think FCI rules, everything's a wing, everything is wings, okay? If you are running in the American Kennel Club, even I think the Canadian Kennel Club, if you are gearing up for those international competitions, you go to those tryouts and things, because they want to basically use the same rules that they're using overseas, they will also have all wings. Every jump is going to have a wing. But American Kennel Club, for you people, in their regular trials, including national championship, championship at Westminster, and agility invitational, okay, largely, in my opinion, due to space considerations, they use many wingless jumps. Okay? So you need, in my opinion, if you, you're going to have two jumps at your house, they need to be wing and wingless so your dog and you can practice on both of them, okay? And the other thing to know is, in AKC, all backsides have to be done on a wing, okay? But I think there is value in training and teaching some backsides on a wing less, so that the dog doesn't use the wing as much to evaluate where to take off, that they're looking at the bar itself. Okay, so I would definitely practice backsides on a wing list, but just know for competition, it's only wings. So those are some key things for you guys to know about wing versus wingless. All right, so that's going to be our last question. We're going to go ahead and stop it here. Good luck, everyone. Don't forget to download the stuff, baddogagility.com forward slash distance. It is on your screen. And if you have any more questions, put them in the comments. We will get to them. And thank you so much for joining us. We will see you all next week. Happy training.